Hello, everybody. Welcome to our World Today Live discussion. We have a full program of news to explore today. So I'm going to just um, give, you know, give it to Nadia so she can explain to us what we're going to talk about. Good afternoon, you guys. We're going to talk about Alexia Navalny's death, which was a major loss for the Russian opposition. Then we'll speak about the protest in Bashkorstan, Russia, which I'm sure Sage can pronounce better. <laughs> and um, we'll discuss what sparked by the activist file Alistrov sentencing. If we have time, we'll speak about Greece uh, legalizing same-sex civil marriage. And then we can talk about Tennessee's law to prohibit women from having abortions. Thank you. All right, so let's dive right into it. Um, Alexei Navalny uh, is uh, said to be dead um, and he died in prison and we don't have a whole lot of information about it, obviously, but basically the whole backstory it was about a few years ago, um, he was um, arrested for his extremist views, um, you know, um, in the eye of the um, of, uh, government in place, extremist views. And it was actually um, something about, like, his views on, like, the... LGBTQ laws, if I'm not mistaken. But like everyone has always felt like it was just um a way to stop him from from running for presidential campaigns, and that his whole uh, ideal and opposition and just this person was blocked out from from power, and for many people he is um, someone who stands for democracy and for were changed and uh, has just been like blocked again and again from doing that, but has never stopped fighting. So it is kind of um, it's kind of a shocking news because it was not that old, and and we know that we won't have like the specifics of what happens in Russia during these times, but we can talk about his influence. Um, what this feels like to us and what this reveals about um <clears throat> Russia and the Russian government right now. So yeah, open floor. I I'm curious to know what you guys feel about that, because obviously this is big news. So I think something that stood out for me as a big question mark is obviously what was the cause of his death given that there was a perception that he was that it was almost a threat to Putin's parliament because of his supposedly extremist views on many things in Russia. And so it kind of, it's kind of the question mark is, was it natural? Was it a death through natural causes? Was it orchestrated in some way? Was he silenced in some way because he was gaining such power or such traction or had such influence? Yeah, I'm, it, it feels like... Um... Is showing that the Russian government and the leadership is um, very like is very scared. You know, it's very fearful, and it feels very um, powerless actually because it's feeling the need to try to like assert this um, assert this power in quote in quotes by. Um, you know, killing this opposition activist. And um, while we don't we don't know for sure how he died because they haven't, as of last I heard, they haven't turned over the body at all. 
yet. And it's been um, like four days or five days. Yeah, since he died. Because they said that um, the first, um, what do you call it? Autopsy? The first autopsy was inconclusive. And so they've got to start over and do another one. And which is like one of the most, just the dumbest lies that you could ever possibly come up with, you know? But I, I guess the question would be, if you're trying to lie about that, what else would you say? Like, what could you say? But that's kind of always been their playbook is just hide behind lies that seem really ridiculous and you only believe them because you've cast your lot with the Russian government. Like you're afraid of them and you feel like, fine, fine, I'll just give my power away to you. I'll believe what you say. I don't care what it is, you know, and they always have to provide a narrative for their for the people who um, choose that so that they have something to say, you know, because they can't just kill him and say nothing, mm -hmm. right? Because then people would, would, would question, right? And so that's what I get from that is that they're very, they're just choosing like cowardice there and they're, they're trying to have this illusion of power. And I felt like Navalny represented like some people also they saw him as a leader but maybe they felt like maybe Navalny will save us from this horrible government and now they've got to understand that like it's all of them like every individual person like saves themselves and chooses God for themselves you know um mm -hmm. or not and it's all of it's all of them that's what I got from that. Yeah, it really shows a strength of like what he really stood for and like what the opposition, what that energy and like consciousness stands for, you know? Yeah. Like it really shows that true power because they, they, yeah, they obviously feel so threatened because like that's real power, right? Because that's like love and it's like he stood with the truth instead of these like ridiculous cor the cor he stood against the corruption you know yeah 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 you brought up a lot of good points um that i want to address first of all it is russia so they value reputation over um above a lot of things um we we've already said that when we you know watched the series Chernobyl and understood how the government wanted to just like cover everything up just so they wanted to have the reputation of um the nation safe, the country safe. Um and then not only like it, people think he's he's been poisoned and actually like before his he was in prison. There was um, he was poisoned once already in an attempt to to assassinate him, and um, it could have been so many things. Basically, like people think that poison, either like drastic or slowly, um, step by step, could have been the reason why um, he died because. He was sick. There was one year where he was sick, actually sick. So we don't really know. Like, but again, it's true. You're going to want to cover up the story. You cannot just say nothing, especially in, in this day and age, and especially with Russia's consciousness of reputation. And they're trying to just like say, like, hey, we look, we look like a government, we act like a government. We act like a democracy or something, or I don't know. We act like a normal government, but we do shit on the new vet is like not good, and they just want to cover it up because they feel like that's how they gain power. Which brings to a third point that you so um rightly shared. Um, this thing about power is definitely something to heal in all of consciousness. Um, for Russian, but overall, 
And I think not only is passing, uh, is definitely bringing a sense of powerlessness for people, but also is bringing it up so that they can heal and say like, hey, this is not just a one person job. And uh, this is all of us, as you said. So <clears throat> yeah, I completely agree with most of the points. Um, and it's definitely good spiritually. Um, not good that he passed away. Let me see. It's definitely good spiritually that we can uh, see so clearly what is to heal, because then maybe like um, people are going to you know take the lead, take their power, not be passive anymore. And just like say like, hey, we cannot accept um some sort of rule for a modicum of safety that isn't even real, you know. So yeah, and but then again, he also had supporters, people that protested, that were in prison, like arrested as well sometimes. But like there are people that actually protest, so. What is of them, especially since the Ukrainian war, have they changed countries? Some of them have changed countries. Do they stay? Do they still fight? And I think it will be interesting to see what they do, how they grow, how they, how they evolve from this point on. So the other thing that was quite interesting that stood out was he was labeled an extremist and a terrorist and was moved into what sounds like the what would we would know as the maximum security prison. So the equivalent would be like the, high, the I don't know what I can't remember what they called it, but literally it's the maximum security in terms of imprisonment and the the perception of an extreme threat, and you know you, you kind of you you kind of have to consider that for that kind of narrative to be publicized, there's obviously a significantly greater power at play in terms of the threat to this perceived power base that they've created for themselves as a government, that one person and his followers, being strong opposition, are also being seen to be significant a significant threat to that stability of that government. And if I mean at the at the core of it, we get we understand very comfortably that the perceived security of that government is farcical. So it's a smoke screen, and that's why somebody can be perceived as such a significant threat to that power base. So things are obviously unraveling, but we also know that the narrative will be controlled significantly because part of it is that people will start to get tired of the tired politics. We've, we've had this conversation countless times that there's a desire for greater stability across many people, it is a conscious desire, and we are seeing it surface over and over and over again, and we're seeing it surface over and over again in people starting to question the narratives around these political rallies and what political parties stand for and who they are actually supporting as their, as their constituency? Is it for themselves? Is it for their constituents? Is it for the greater good of the population? So there's going to be a significant question mark going forward, given that so many countries are going into major elections in this year. So, you know, in South Africa, we've just had the budget speech and also a conversation that happened was a drawdown from reserves that nobody necessarily knew were there. And the question is, well, if we had these reserves, why haven't they been used before? 
or is this their play at a lifeline because they are now being seen to be doing something for the population. So there's always going to be the question and the questions amongst many voters and constituents to say, well, actually, what are you in it for? Are you in it for yourself or are you in it for us? And how stable is your power and how easily threatened is your power? And is that why you are playing such an extremist game? And it's important to note that as unionists, we don't believe that truly a person can pass away because our soul is eternal. So knowing that we know that, you know, Alexia is still very much here in our consciousness, causing a movement that someone else will also take part in and grow and expand. Yeah, I'm sorry if that's what you say about this, because I feel like uh, a lot of the things that we're, we're seeing in Bashkortostan are similar to um, what we've been talking about with Navalny. And it's, it speaks to the way Russia just handles uh, any type of Opposition, uprising, it's not, even, it's not even uprising, so to speak. But, Grenda, I think you're the one that researched this. Do you want to talk a little bit more about the context of things? I know it is complicated, but globally, so that people can understand how this is working out, basically. So I think it was Sage's story, not mm -hmm. mine. Sorry, my bad. Um, I was like confused with you. Like I don't know who did what. So Sage. Yeah, yeah. So I I feel like um the connection here between the stories is like looking at Russian opposition and seeing like are they is the Russian opposition united or is it kind of is it kind of divided and um maybe could the p different people who have um who have issues with the russian government could they come together in common you know perhaps or something like that like that's a question that that came to my mind because um so in in bashkortostan it's like this little um i think they call it an autonomous either republic or um a region in akruk and they like are supposed to have regional autonomy, right? Like Russia was, that That was the whole idea was that there are these republics and autonomous regions that are supposed to have a lot of autonomy except in international affairs, right? And so they, Vladimir Putin kind of like has clawed that back in his like clever way throughout the years and he, Nowadays, in all pretty much all those republics that, that I know of, like Bashkortostan, there's just a really pro-Putin guy who's in office and through election fraud um, and voter suppression or whatever they do, he's kept in power. And so, and he gets to like be a gangster and profit and take money from, uh, get, get business deals and get kickbacks and in exchange for being Putin's like, slave basically or puppet in the region and so because of this these activists have risen up their main issues have been like bashkir cultural autonomy like the right to use and speak their language the right to like have their cultural sites protected like a few years some years ago um a mine was uh like what there's a these four sacred hills that were sacred in their like culture and one was like made into a mine and was destroyed. So these different activists r rose up and the main one was this guy named um, Alsanov. I don't remember his first name, but he was jailed recently. And that's, there was this big protest in Bashkortostan, like a thousand plus people 
came um, came out to like demonstrate because they're like, why did you jail this guy? You know, and it was some it was like some bogus charges. I don't remember what it was, but basically the reason was because he was like opposing the Russian government's will. Um, there was some sort of environmental activism he was doing. So it wasn't even it wasn't like anti-Ukraine war, but there is some um, uh, there have been some protests and just people speaking out who are Bashkir, like uh, there's a video that some Bashkir soldiers made who are serving uh, in Ukraine and who said like, we're not gonna basically, if you're gonna like abuse our people, we're not gonna fight for you. And they were saying like, maybe seriously or not, like we'll take the fight to you. Like we'll turn around on you because you're abusing our people. And so I was like, oh, that's interesting because that could be a sign that the Russian regime is cracking and there could be multiple angles of this, you know, because like the, the relationship there isn't very, is exploitative, it kind of, and with the ethnic minorities in Russia. So that was that kind of that little piece there. And um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know where that leaves us, but yeah with that but what do you guys feel i think like the funniest thing so to speak is that um they um did the some sort of silent passive silent pacific protests and there was only people that had like kara halik which means that like, black people or people of color um written somewhere on their back or on a paper, on a piece of paper. And to be honest, like just that thing shouldn't be something seen as a threat or an opposition to a government. But they were taken to buses and arrested at least two people um, in this specific protest on the account of being extremists and terrorists. So the parallel here with Navalny's story is, I, I would say it's uncanny, like extremists and terrorists for saying Kara Halik, I, um, I don't know, I don't know where to stand on this. It's just like, um, and you know, the, the media, the, the media article, obviously like, it stands for um, the people like the Bashkir people. Um, and it says like, it's spilling back. It's not saying that they're protesting the authoritarianism of Russia. It's saying it's spilling back the layers of the authoritarian regime. So they're not doing actually much but just very doing is spilling back the layers of a regime that is authoritarian. And I think there is not much else to say about this, except that it's true. Like the, the article is actually very true in the sense that um, it's revealing how nonsensical and ridiculous and strict and tight the regime is trying to be. And I think, to be honest, when we don't have anything to say but this, I feel like it's just very straightforward. And uh, yeah, it, it, there's just that only hoping that um, there's a way for Russian people because there are so many like little nations and ethnic groups in it can actually unite to see that like in in harmony like there is like a power to actually have change because we have a power you know but yeah i don't know i don't know what form it's going to take uh, there are so many so many different groups um protesting or standing up for so many different things but there must be something that you know, unites people and that that's gotta be like actual freedom, like democracy or liberty. So 
um, I think maybe the thing that we can reflect on is like again, we haven't asked that question in a while, but what is the, sh the choice that Russian people are making right now? So I kind of feel like as opposed to a peeling back process, because the peeling back process to me is almost revealing something. Whereas this feels more like a ball of yarn that's unraveling. So all these threads have been pulled together and slowly each person is pulling the string that they can influence in a way that's going to pull apart the ball of messy yarn that somebody tried to wind so tightly. They tried to bound it up so tightly that in the unravelment, it's probably going to change the, comp the picture of politics in Russia quite significantly if these components of opposition continue down their road. And I think this is why the leaders of those oppositions are being removed because they're being seen to be the proponent of the unraveling. And yet their power base is more the proponent, proponent of the unraveling. Because it doesn't, if it, if it hinges on one person, it's not necessarily a powerful enough movement. But if it hinges on the consciousness of a few like-minded people who are doing it in such a manner that they're not moving into a significantly violent route that's obviously going to bring about a level of retaliation. They are actually showing how the level of authoritarianism and control has been what has been holding this thing together. And so you strip out the control and the whole thing just kind of unbundles. It has to fall apart. There's nothing holding it together and it doesn't hinge on the politics of propaganda anymore because there's so many people addressing it from so many different angles. Yes, this analogy on control, um, I can resonate with because if you realize when you try to control you become even more weakened because you're exerting so much energy into a certain control. And I feel that with protest, if they're executed appropriately, they can very much hit the weak points that the Russian government has so hard tried to control and uh, keep intact. So I do feel like there is an unraveling or appealing that's going on that if the consciousness can continue to, you know, stay focused on being powerful instead of powerless, then it will very much change the course of what Russian government has been going through. Yeah, pretty much. I feel like um, the only thing that I would say is that I think it may still be a peeling back of um, the authoritarian regime for Russian people on the inside. It's kind of like, um, I would say, in, in a relationship, you know, there is one moment where you feel like the relationship is kind of okay. It has its moments where it's not feeling good at all. But, like, um, you stay around and sometimes where nothing happens, you feel like it's okay. It's never really good, but you're not really realizing it. And then it starts to be bad over time. Or the bad gets worse. Like, the, the lows get lower. You, you know, there's something like that. And you start to realize, like, ah, okay, so maybe inside of it like the relationship was never good i'm just experiencing like very bad moments with okay moments and the okay moments are are there to just make me stay in the relationship 
and just like take my energy or something like that. And then when I peel back, I realize like, oh, this is bad. And, and so I withdraw my energy. I take power and maybe there's a fuss and, and things like that. But I'm sure that I'm taking back my power or something. Or sometimes like, you know, I fall back into a pattern and I say like, oh, I'm sure this person is going to change. And I fall back into it and uh, and just starts all, all over again. And so this feeling of like just having a relationship where you you, you wouldn't see how bad it was, um, it feels like the peeling back is still happening inside Russia. Obviously, like for a lot of people, um, it's pretty obvious that it's been authoritarian for like 10 years, you know. But yeah, it's just like, you know, it's a process and you gotta have compassion for people who are going through this process because we all know how hard it is. And we all reveal relationships where, oh my God, like, was he ever truly a friend, a partner, or parents, or was it just taking my energy and, and smoothing things over, making me feel like it was okay when actually it was not. So, yeah, that's just like, yeah, I think in that sense, I feel like the peeling back is actually happening for a lot of people that are realizing, okay, like this is my home, but my home is pretty shit right now. So what do I do, you know? And uh, yeah, that's it. I don't know if you guys have any feeling about what I've just said or you agree and yeah. I do know that Putin has set such a facade for himself that a lot of people are like diehard fans of his authority, his government, and how he just seems to proceed, continue to proceed. So when you're in a home that or a relationship that is like really shitty, but you still believe in that facade that like, he is such a great man. There's obviously there's going to be turmoil, but we're going to get through this. Um, it's really coming down to a choice of like, are you going to continue to believe in this facade or are you going to see the reality and accept it as it is and know that you can be the turning point for it? So I agree with Yurin a lot more in that, yes, he may have created this facade, but you know, that feeling of not being at home in your own home starts to actually bother you. It starts to make you ask questions about what home feels like or what home should feel like. And it's the same thing with love. If it doesn't feel like love in one form or another, is it really love? And so it starts to actually just bring you back to yourself, to ask yourself, well, you know, is this how I love myself and how I want to love myself and how I want to value myself? And is this how I'm going to discount myself and my perceptions and my feelings under these circumstances? And if any one of those starts to be a niggle towards a no, then you know something's not right. And once you know that something's not right, you can't unknow it. Regardless of how much of a perception somebody else is creating of how wonderful they may be. And it literally speaks to that narcissistic relationship where everybody else thinks this person is fabulous but you have to deal with the monster in the background or the monster in the closet or whatever the hell they choose to manifest as when you are alone together. And so it does bring you back to yourself to say, well, listen, do I appreciate this type of thing in my life? And if I do, what does it say about me and where do I need to heal? Because if you continue to discount your own feelings about not feeling at home, in your home, you are actually the problem.
I think it takes power to realize um, how much power it was taken from you to stay. Um, we don't have the emotional, spiritual, whatever education to recognize that in our world. And so that's a journey and a half for me, you know? It's, um, yeah, you go a long way, especially when it's your country that's kind of abusing you. You go a long ways into discovering what feels good to you or not, you know? Yeah. So, Nadja, do you feel yeah. like the next story or the next thing to say? Just a little tidbit and then we can move on to the next story. Oh, I okay. I feel like like from my perspective, it also has to do with like this settling energy because you may not think that anything greater than what you've experienced is meant for you because you may think that it's meant for someone else but not meant for you. So in Russia, they may be thinking like, no, we're meant for this hardship and we're meant for whatever turmoil is going on. And then like, they don't look outside of that glass ceiling to know that like, no, everyone is equal here and everyone is meant for such a deep, unconditional love. And we did speak a little bit of the protest that's been going on. Sage, would you like to add anything else about the protest before we move on to Greece? Okay. Well, very good news at Greece. We are, um, we received news that Greece has legalized same-sex marriage, which is awesome. Uh, continue that conversation that we are equal and we deserve deep, unconditional love. And this has been an opening in Greece of um, higher love. How do you guys feel about this? We've been, um, I don't know, N Nilam is the one that, you know, in our team researches um, um, anything LGBTQ studies, ethnic groups, cultural things, um, gender studies. And we've been tracking this story for a few weeks to months now. There was like, um, you know, softening of the laws. Um, in Greece about LGBTQ um, relationships. And I didn't think that it was going to happen so quickly that legalization of same-sex marriage um, would be done. And I think it's a huge, huge upgrade because I remember six years ago, um, my Greek friends were saying that Greek people were so not accepting still culturally of anything that had to do with LGBTQ, um, the, the LGBTQ plus community. And to see that a few years afterwards, I feel like it's kind of, um, there is a maturing in the energy for me, like a growing up and almost like a transition. I don't know if it's COVID, it's, uh, the influence of social media, the fact that they actually have a big LGBTQ plus community that is uh, taking the power, but taking the power in peace, you know? Like there was no big thing happening around this. It was just so peaceful. And I don't know, I feel like it's important to talk about it today because it does happen in some countries, but it's super peaceful like that. And I think it's worth mentioning and I don't know the details of it because I haven't followed anything around the LGBTQ community except from the softening of the laws a few months ago and six years ago about where it was culturally. So that's just my honest feeling. But it could be something different. And you also could have like different views on it. So I'm curious to know... Um, what, what you felt um, looking into this story. Just thought it was a huge victory. And um, 
especially since Greece is, you know, they've been, they're just so traditional and it's been that way. Um, so I just, I think it's great. And um, I also think it's so beautiful that, so it was the passing of marriage, but also LGBT couples um, for adopting children, which is also really awesome, so. Yeah, it's cool. And I, I also, um, yeah, I, I was feeling like um, the, there's a feeling of like, um, there's just enough support in Greece for this to happen. And in the article that, that we read, it, um, it pointed out that like, there were some cross party votes that had to happen. Like some people had to kind of like, um, people from different parties in Greece's parliament had to come together for this to happen. So it was kind of like, yeah, a case of like, people coming together over something that they felt was right versus on like, I guess, party lines, you know? So I felt that was cool. And um, yeah. And I know too that um, the, the church in Greece, like the Greek Orthodox church is still, you know, still feels that homosexuality is like sinful. Um, and I feel like it kind of shows how when the churches get really like focused on like tradition and they they don't like adapt to the times or really re-examine an issue as it comes up, they start to kind of like um, drift further from the people, like from most people. And I'm not saying that I I don't know if Greece is like a super religious country, but yeah, I feel like it's just showing that, that people's hearts are changing, maybe like faster than the church is changing, you know? So that's what I felt mm -hmm. from it. Yeah, and it's also they're, they don't, they're, they don't stay aligned with the actual divine consciousness, you know, if they were really like choosing to do that as a religious organization, you know, yeah. like they're, they're not evolving in that way, you know? Yeah, maybe though, like, because usually I feel, when these things happen, people within the organization start to be like, oh, I'm going to like split off from it or, oh, I'm just going to like do my own thing, you know, like Greek, like orthodoxy, our religion doesn't have to be this too. Like a lot of Mormons um, have done that in the U.S. over this, hmm. you know, LGBT yeah, thing. Yeah. That's an interesting pattern. Um, I just know that they're... Um, People are really like some people are really accepted of the LGBT, LGBTQ communities while being Orthodox Orthodox Catholic. It's like Orthodox Christian. You know the churches of like um Eastern Europe, Russia and things like that. Um and also Muslim Muslim people because the um Ottoman Empire was really big there up until world war one so it's pretty really just country um and yes i think there is a lot of healing to be done there because they have such a history culturally of like um you know where the thoughts of democracy were kind of born and their cultural um, activities of um, cities before, um, you know, before the Middle Age, like I don't, I don't remember what it's called in English, but before the Middle Age, like the activities of the cities were like more um, geared towards like democracy and there was like a, a freedom of kind of not being married to someone of the same sex as you, but relationships at least were kind of accepted, mostly accepted. And so I feel like, um, you know, obviously it's, it was not perfect, it was not an utopia or something, but it feels like they're kind of um, linking back to everything that makes them them culturally. So it's kind of um good healing to see like, hey, you know, I have this history, I have this culture, um, I also have this religion, 
but that doesn't, you know, it isn't in opposition with who I am and my sexuality and the way I live, which is um, a pretty good way of seeing things, you know. Yeah. I like that you mentioned the, the, the and I'm, just to correct me if I'm wrong, but it was the it was almost the birthplace of what 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 is now considered modern democracy, right? So at the time, the thinking was much more progressive than most other countries, and so you can see that throughout history, the thinking continues to be a little bit more progressive. So they tend to set the tone in some of these shifts. And you can see through the law over the last few years how they've continued to set a tone in terms of extending greater rights to LGBTQ people in the country, almost outlawing conversion therapy, allowing recognition of same-sex partnerships even before it became legalized. So, they, you know, there they, they just seems to be a consciousness of progression within Greek consciousness. And it definitely is just a continuation of the historical trend that we've seen in the evolution of Greece. So I definitely believe that they are setting a tone. I also believe that given that some of the greatest thinkers of various centuries are of Greek descent and have influenced philosophy for a long, long time, it does help that we have we have a consciousness of progression there, so that it is it, it almost takes hold in a way that's very direct, you know. And so you can't again you can't unsee it or unknow it once it's known or revealed or something to that effect. So I think it it it's a good story, but it's also a hopeful story that there's a continuation of leading the progression of thought. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they're a birthplace of ancient democracy, but their text was uh, were some of the foundational texts on which were based modern democracies, namely France, um, and afterwards the United States and things like that. And we still study their texts in uh, political science. But it's so interesting that you're saying that it feels like, you know, even like, you know, several millennia afterwards, there is still a cultural impact, you know, and that feels very cool. And I think, I guess we see it in terms of like, you know, we know Greek culture, we know Greek gods, we have um, all these things, all this art, all this history around and mythology, but um, it's also in more, more subtle things like, you know, social change and evolution and evolution and, and political change. So that's very interesting to talk about for sure. Yeah. And this background is very telling because the way the laws have shifted so peacefully, it happens so in such a grounding way, like very um, unshakable. So it was very much from the background of history of such a democracy. And yeah. Um, <laughs> do we have time for our last story? Okay, so. so let's transition to Tennessee and speak about um, anti-abortion law. Yeah. So, um, basically, um, we, in our chat, we have a group chat where we talk about the articles of the week. Um, it was shared 
um, an article was shared about the consequences of overturning Roe versus Wade and um, on the mothers. And unsurprisingly, I would say, um, the conclusions of that, it seemed, in the summary at least, I, I'm sorry, and I, there were very graphic photos and I did not have the heart to look at them this week. But for those who looked at them or looked at the article fully, you can corroborate my story. But the summary was that, um, you know, the government was hell-bent on, Tennessee government was hell-bent on applying the overturned bill, uh, basically like the restrictions after the overturned bill. And however, like the support of mothers afterwards was not there at all. And I think um, that's a conclusion that a lot of people had already arrived in, but seeing the consequences of it on on mother's life is, um, is kind of daunting. It's, um, it's disappointing, it's sad. And, and I, I'm, I'm just like thrown back to the moment um, it got overturned by the Supreme Court and the, the overall feeling of um, no respect for the woman's life, no respect for life at all, actually. And I think even though we've healed and it's been several years, like the, the feeling is kind of still there a little bit. So it's been two years, almost. And uh, I just want, you know, let's finish on that. It's not the super joyful, super joyful news, but I think it's important to talk about it. So how do you feel about this, guys? And uh, do you want to add anything that was said in, in the, the article that I didn't read? Yeah, I guess um, what it, the article was basically saying that um, it would have been, she if she wanted to make a different choice at this particular mother than what she did, she would have had to break the law in some way. So like abortion is illegal in Tennessee unless um, there's like a clear danger to the mother's life. But a lot of doctors like don't, wouldn't perform the abortion until like the mother is literally on the edge because they would want it to be absolutely certain. Otherwise they could like be criminally charged and stuff and fined and in jail. So that wouldn't have been an option or she would have had to find a doctor who could do it in Tennessee and who was willing to stand up to the law there, you know, and defy the law there. And then um, she couldn't go out of state legally, you know, cause she was um, I think on parole and it, yeah, I think it was that um, cause she had been in prison. So it would have been a violation of her parole to leave the state. So like she had to carry this pregnancy to term, but the doctors knew that it, it was life threatening potentially because it was in scar tissue, you know? So, um, yeah, but she, she did end up carrying the pregnancy to term and she had the baby and the baby is, was born prematurely, but is doing well now, you know, and it's been really effective, like the treatments and everything. So that's the positive side of the story. Um, it didn't remember her it saying that she was like, it was really um, bad for her, but it was a very traumatic, like difficult, I mean, um, birth, but like they're ending up okay. But like their biggest struggle now was that she was already struggling to support her one child. And now this, she had this other child who um, requires so much more care and it's just been financially really difficult for them too. So yeah, that's, that's, I wanted to add that piece of it too. And just like, um, yeah. And I guess we could ask like, like what choices were made there or like what, what is the answer, the right thing to do in that situation and everything like that, the best that we can tell and, and everything. Yeah. 
Danville, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, so, I, you know, I, I just, I feel like there's a lot of unintended consequences of overturning Roe versus Wade that are not going to be seen for a while. But what it will do is it's going to impact the quality of life of those mothers forced to give birth, of those children forced to live. Because the, the fact of the matter is, as much as there may be proponents that say abortion is not respecting life, there's also, there's also certain things that we know spiritually about our own soul contracts and those kind of things. And so a soul contract could very well have been that a mother experiences the sensation of being pregnant but not having a child because that soul needed to experience that. And so, you know, it's just, it, it interferes with a lot of things that I feel like that almost unbalances reality from the perspective that somebody's choice is literally almost eroded. And we also know that our choice is generally sacrosanct. That, that is what leads us to grow. Our choice to, our, our decision to do something or our choice in that instance and our will to follow through with the action steps in whatever way we choose to do that. And here we have it legislated that your choice isn't as powerful as what we firmly believe it is. And so it, 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 I feel like it's a very spiritually unsettling. But again, that may just be a lesson that consciousness needs to learn through this high level of contrast. That's a pretty hard way to learn it. That's all I could say. But, yeah. Yeah, this lack of respect for a woman's body and lack of autonomy is something that definitely needs to be healed because in the U.S. we have like compoundments of the society giving us this way of life that we need to live. And so it needs to be healed layer after layer. If I was her, I would probably break my parole and go to another state. But that is a decision that everyone has to take in their own individual hands and, you know, take into account of where their life would go. And I want to ask you guys, like, what do you guys, what would you guys do in this situation? I think it's one of those where you, you don't know what you're going to do in this situation. Like, there is no good answer. Like, we can say, like, if it's I say, you know, there's a catastrophe or uh, a mass shooting or things like that. You're going to say, if I was here, like, if I were here, I'm going to do this, do that. But you don't know. You actually don't know. And the thing is, like, women have been in prison for less than breaking parole. Um, and with harsh sanctions, too. So... That's a difficult situation in all cases, I would say. Yeah. But, yeah. I'm sure like we could go deeper on that and I, I we absolutely need to go deeper on that because we can we can't really be done with this until like this situation is resolved because it's really like a health problem. But this is all the time we have for today. So We'll continue this um, in another discussion. Thank you very sincerely to everyone who's watched us live and who's watching us from YouTube. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share if you enjoy this so we can do more. And, you know, you can also propose things that you'd like us to talk about. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. See you.